good afternoon everyone and uh, welcome back this is the last session so uh but an important one last not the least uh, we looked at the overview of climate change the impacts and some of the possible solutions we also came up with like different departments sat and together how uh, what are some of the ecological footprints that each of the department is having and also some of the solutions that we could have <clears throat> I, uh, my presentation was as you can see is um, on the climate risk and how vulnerability assessment framework is done it's a bit technical but we also need to understand as a group of uh, officers a group of civilians we need to understand how those assessments actually go because a lot of the stakeholder uh, discussions a um, lot of the departments are also called and it's an interdepartmental process when policies are formed so each department has to give their own uh, contribution to these frameworks so it's it's uh, important to understand at, at least the the basics of how that's done but before that i just want to touch on a a, a basic history as in why those vulnerability assessments came about uh, how does the climate risk you know uh, compare to the real world uh, professor nag in the morning mentioned uh, the overall climate change and global warming issues does anyone remember ozone layers the ozone hole that we were having everyone should have heard about at least when we are growing up uh, i specifically remember because in our schools we used to read a lot about them but now we don't really talk about it and i was thinking why is this disconnect right in our colleges and universities now we don't necessarily talk about just ozone layer we we talk about climate change and carbon emissions or methane emissions uh, there is a reason for that and that reason is is actually a happy story and that's what uh, i want to share began somewhere around 1970s right uh, that's why the ozone layer was so important so uh, one scientist but is also team actually three scientists work on this and they found that the earth's ozone layer which is uh, the topmost layer of our stratosphere was actually being depleted at a much faster pace right so if we see uh, our globe as something and we have our atmosphere but the topmost layer is the stratosphere right and on the stratosphere the topmost layer is the ozone layer right and that's the reason why ozone layer is important because it's receiving all the what are we receiving the ultraviolet rays yes thanks so <clears throat> yes the we do need sun rays but we also need a filter if it's direct uv then you know it's very very uh, harmful to human beings so what these scientists noticed and this is antarctica by the way right i'll come to the graph right uh, in, in some time so what they saw was that this ozone was being depleted and it's not just here of course it's around the globe say for example let's see this is let's say this is antarctica and then they what they were seeing is this this ozone layer being you know slowly but steadily and also at much a faster rate you know depleting so what happened was the amount of ozone which is o3 was decreasing right so the uh, the requirement was that we would need more ozone right but it was moving away and they also found that because this was happening it had repercussions over all of the globe so yes it was much intense here and that's why that's one of the reasons of uh, the polar ice caps melting right uh, that's where that actually began but it was also reper it had re repercussions and it was affecting whole of the ozone so net net we can say that the amount of ozone was going down in in our in our solar in in our, in our earth right so and this graph i'm not sure if it's clear from here it is clear so this mentions the total ozone right if you can see so ozone is measured in something called as dobson's units but that's just the measurement okay so maybe a meter or a kilometer so 
if we go, this is the dark side, which is zero ozone, and this is the lighter side is, is more ozone. So to combat this, what, what did we need? We needed more ozone, right? And we were seeing that, you see, you can see the ozone layer here is actually going down. That's why it's, it's purple right here, but it's overall, it's green. So green is somewhere here which is you know, ideal for it. And then somewhere you can see the reds also there again, which is like more, more options units, but especially over Antarctica, it was you know, increasing. So it's more uh, darker, which means less ozone. And that is the problem. How did we combat it as a human species, as you know, humanity, it came together. That's where the science was important. So in 1970s, uh, early 1970s, the, the group of scientists, I'll, I'll show them uh, later, they found out and they went to the Antarctic. They did a lot of tests and found out the main thing was this, that ozone was, you know, the ozone amount was decreasing, right? And so there was a huge outcry in the 1970s. And we also see that in India as well, where our, all of our textbooks actually mention that, even from our middle school levels. The good thing is that uh, these studies were actually implemented, the solutions, the problems, it was actually talked about in the international treaties in the UN. So we did come up with something, which is, uh, I'll come to it later, but you can see this is 1979 and in 87, around six, and this is still 2011. Of course, we have data till 2022, but this is where we saw that it's getting a little better, right? And that is when uh, the topic about ozone or ozone layer or ozone hole actually went down because we, we were seeing that the earth was healing itself, right? So we can see these parts are not that dark, right? But it's, it's coming a bit about green and overall as well. So these red patches are also moving away. So what they found was that this hole was shrinking. Okay. And this was all possible because of the Montreal Protocol, which is in 1987. Right. And right after that in 1992, which you mentioned was uh, the talk about greenhouse gases, but the most important one was the ozone concentration. So what, what Mont Montreal Protocol did, can anyone say or did, does anyone remember what was the, what was the problem? Of course, uh, I forgot to touch this. So, of course, the ozone was decreasing. But what was happening in the world that was adding to this? Right? So, human activities, if we remember all of our coolants that we used in our refrigerators, in our ACs, were all called something called CFCs. We must have heard that. So it was chlorofluorocarbons. And as I said, they went to the Antarctic, uh, they set up camps and did all these tests. And they found out the main reason was CFCs. Because all of these coolants, even with our uh, small amounts we had uh, in our deodorants, which had the cooling factor, it was all CFCs in, in 1980s and 1970s. <clears throat> so they found out this. So now, of course, the solution is if we can get this down, Right, this will go up. Right, and so the earth can heal. So the Montreal Protocol had banned all of the CFCs, especially in in the larger countries, Russia or the US or China. What happened was that, and then again, scientists came into form because we now wanted we we cannot let go refrigerators or ACs, right? We we do need them. So what is this? How how do we combat this? And it's not like we have to reduce this, we have to completely negate it. Otherwise, we are all going to get UVs. And there was, I, I believe there was a study which mentioned, I forgot the percentage, but like half of the human population till 2020 would have had skin cancer because of the, the high UV, right? So the solution was that alternatives, right? What if we could find other gases, which were also coolants? which would give us the same ACs, the same refrigerators, but remove this. And of course, we did find that. It's called HCFs, the hydrochlorofluorocarbons. Uh, hydrofluorocarbons. 
so one of the carbon is gone now. sorry the chlorine is gone now. and mostly it was hfcs but there were other small gases as well but the thing is when we found this cfcs were completely removed so now that's what we were seeing in the the previous one in in about 2011 it was showing a little bit progress because even after when 1978 the montreal protocol came but still because we had so much of cfcs in our atmosphere it did take some time to deplete it off right but the good news is that it was healing ah uh, let's see if we do this uh, concentration yeah so this was again a model of course they did that model around 1980s so which said if we had the same ozone concentration this was going to be the case in 1974 it was like this so the real time data was this if we see the the dark blue is the the lowest ozone and they said by 2064 it would actually look like this where would have every like the whole of the ozone layer was going to vanish and we'd find the 2064 where you know all of the humans had some sort of deformity some cancer and stuff um But this also says is that, yeah, this this layer was healing. This Antarctic, see, this is blue, dark blue, but now it's coming. The the blue is going away, right? Um, because of the Montreal Protocol, this happened, right? And again, this is uh, a bit technical model, but this is what they came out with. This is the model and the real world. As scientists, uh, especially me, I'm very excited with. creating all those models but not all those models uh, resemble the real world but this model did so what they found was that if the ozone uh, if we did not do anything about the ozone this would have been our future which said by 2064 uh, so the total ozone would have gone down right and it was completely vanished by 2060 this is what it said so 1987 <coughs> and about 2000s it started getting better so this is our future reference where our ozone was getting replenished again right and this is the uv index which is related with it, uh, with it so the uv index would have increased this much by 2060 where all the ozone would have gone away but now this is the reference future where we have that uh, our uv radiations are more or less almost the same that we are facing right so and this is the real world where the real world has been some somewhat kinder and the observations and the predicted this this is the part that the world avoided this is again uv again yeah stratospheric chlorine so chlorine was removed so the world avoided this and we are going somewhere into this right so this is a i believe a happy story and these were the scientists who did it so molina was was the leading scientist and his, his crew they got the nobel prize in chemistry because of that in 1995 this shows us how science arts and all the civil society each of one of us as humans um, are important because not only did they believe the scientists then we also went into the montreal protocol which helped us remove this this big problem now we have other problems of course but this a huge problem was gone okay also if if you go about and research it again they are now saying by 2023 23 this is getting back as in the ozone is going down again right but they're measuring every year but it it's not as severe as it was in 1970s hopefully we can get back but again as i said the uh the alternatives which is hfcs and other gases the thing is they also have a problem not as severe as cfcs but they 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 are still a problem so we do need to find out you know hopefully scientists will find out something else but for now this is a success story where something was in uh, you know not invented as in they reported the problem they got to the key determinant and the world pushed for the montreal protocol so the protocol was in place and all of the countries had their own laws based on that and they banned completely banned cfcs actually and then got other alternatives and now we are back uh, the ozone is coming back again 
because why this is important is uh, the reason is we do we did have that global trend but we are also having a lot of local problems not just for uh, carbon emissions but other problems as well other you know gases and other uh, uh, waste that 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 the that human that, that humans generate so there's a need to understand how we go from global to local local i wanted to uh, you know emphasize on that example because one key thing that you would you know take away from that is that they what they did was uh, measure the intensity and frequency of the risk right they got all the models and and they did all the tests and found out what was the risk how the world was vulnerable and if we did nothing what was going to happen you know not just to the ecosystems and biodiversity humans would have actually perished so that's that is what our exercise is also going to be so two things that we can take from that one is the identification of risks right? and also how vulnerable our ecosystems are be it local be it global we need an assessment framework we need to understand what are the natural forces working against us what are the human made forces how are we accelerating them as well so when we identify them we now have something in our hands to be able to solve that problem okay now let's uh, get back to very very local very very specific example which is so in in the indian himalayan region ihr this is a accepted protocol which is the rba right and again this rba is like a stakeholder assessment where you get experts from different departments they brainstorm and they work out their assessment and you know create a vulnerability map saying which of the sectors are more vulnerable how are we vulnerable based on parameters such as they they talk about topography right uh, disaster trends what are the climate scenarios if there are any projections what is the status of infrastructure right that's also an impact how is the state being governed so this is all being used and again uh, i'll come to this so we do have a you know published uh, rva for shillong as well so that's what we're going to do as an example but uh because we are going to did you give this yeah so you you'll have gotten this table right uh let's just say this is not just shillong but this a, a mountain ecosystem where these are some of this you know is, um you know typical hazards that we are saying again uh one keyword is hazard that we were saying is uh climate risk so we are going to keep talking about hazard again and again so these are climate related hazards of course the glacial uh, areas are melting so what happens is that we we have avalanches and then heavy snow or cold extremes actually cause extremes of floods or flash floods that we see again we do have a lot of wildfires that are going on uh, there could be different determinants to it and then this is where mostly the human beings are here so we face everything that's been you know toppling down so we have landslides we have ecosystem degradation especially if we have monocultures like this which which is not very beneficial to 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 our ecosystems so these are some of the examples of uh, climate risk hazards that we can use maybe in our exercises yeah so this is the final one where uh, the vulnerability assessment the rva is based on this higgs framework right and we can use this for a lot of things which is very helpful uh, there is a lot of text i'm sorry again but this is that um, higgs framework so the first one is the hazard so the stakeholders actually identify hazards which is mostly climate so temperature precipitation what is the mean sea level the frequency of droughts or floods or frequency of cyclones and we have to adopt it in as per our uh, requirements another key uh, factor is infrastructure and govern and urban sectors uh, indicators of course water supply how is the sewage system is there a solid waste management system available is there storm water drainage available transportation power housing some of the key things that we've been talking since the first day 
also governance issues again one of the key things that i'm taking away from this uh, from this workshop is that we have a lot of policies but as all of you have uh, you know rightly pointed out the governance or the implementation is a problem not only um, nationally but also very very locally so how is the governance and institutions taking care of it is there participation is there transparency does the government uh, not just government sorry that does the departments whichever is uh, responsible for their um, you know policies and governance are they being accountable okay uh, is there resource efficiency is there innovative financing financing we need money for everything of course and then social economic factors that's the final one where this is all the human problems or human issues of course we, I, I should not call it problems the demography <laughs> right was the slum population if there's more poverty it's going to be difficult for that ecosystem to be you know it's it's more vulnerable if there's if there's if there's a larger uh, you know slum population what's the literacy rate uh, what is the migration flow right is it inward is it outward what is the urbanization trend is it getting more urban at a much faster speed than it can handle right uh, yeah and then this is taken from this report okay so we have hazards h uh, infrastructure i governance and social economy so this is the higgs framework which now you would have to list down <laughs> right so you can see in our table i think we can start with the uh just yeah mapping hazards and vulnerability so it's a i mean i'll i'll just share the report later which is very innovative and uh, very thought out and a thorough process uh, they use a lot of data from a lot of sources but as a community and we have a very uh, you know short time frame so i just wanted to have this exercise where they actually in the report they do have this table right they have identified the hazards for shillong they did a, did that for 10 cities and shillong was one of them 10 cities in india so they have the hazards and then they have the frequency for example anyone wants to uh, name one hazard that maybe shillong faces can you say because you're going to have to write down anyways landslides maybe so yeah cool. say landslides so landslides and this is what you have to do say frequency saying across a year just a frequency so you can mention and that's what i mentioned frequency and intensity will be on a scale of 1 to 10 so if you see if you say that okay the the frequency is very high that shillong uh, is facing a lot of uh, landslides then you could you know something in the range of 8 or 7 so if it's closer to 10 then it's higher and this is lower okay this is clear uh, same with the intensity so maybe landslides are not that intense so you would score them in uh, somewhere near 1 if it's higher then somewhere near 10 and lastly this is the impact on population life livelihood and livestock uh, i should have given a table here okay so this is just yes or no thing you can just have a tick or a cross so population meaning does landslide is landslide affecting our population the human population is it going down or is it going up it won't go up of course <laughs> is it going down uh, at a much faster rate than uh, biological reasons then second is life but this this means life sufferings like saying people uh, you know getting more diseases or people getting uh, trapped in those disasters losing lives in terms of landslides livelihood of course it is affecting our income and then livestock right so this is the first table and the first exercise and the second one is also very simple you just have to mention the same hazards here right and then just say if it's present or absent in these months right or just shade it out How many hazards? At least minimum number. They can give like there are a lot of boxes about ten, eleven. 
Of course, you don't need to complete all of the boxes, just the ones that you feel relevant. There are a lot of boxes here. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, whatever uh, looks okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so our group have listed uh, these few hazards which we feel is like uh, occurring quite often in Shillong City. So the first one is flood. We have given uh, frequency two, intensity one. Uh, does it affect the population? Yes. Does it affect life? Yes. Livelihood? Yes. And livestock? Yes. Second one is landslide. Uh, we've seen that most of the landslide in Shillong, it's a uh, rainfall related landslide. So frequency two, intensity one, population, yes, it affects life. Also, it's affecting uh, life, livelihood, as well as livestock. Earthquake. Since we're in the uh, fifth, uh, fifth uh, zone of the seismic zones, so we, uh, we, we do experience earthquakes from time to time. So frequency we have given five, intensity five, and it is affecting population, life, life or livelihood as well as li livestock. Then the most frequent hazard that we feel is road accidents. Uh, so we have given uh, eight uh, for frequency. Intensity is eight. Uh, it affects the population. It affects life. It affects livelihood as well as livestock. Then uh, we do experience a uh, cyclonic storm also from time to time whenever there's a depression in Bay of Bengal. So frequency we have given uh, three, intensity three. Uh, it does affect the population, life, life uh, livelihood as well as livestock. Then the, uh, uh, the other one, the other hazard that we have uh, jet downed is traffic jammed. Uh, that uh, we have given 10 the frequency. Intensity also 10 and it affects uh, the population, live, livelihood as well as livestock. Then uh, we have been experiencing a change in climate. So we have, the, we have noted that down also. So frequency we have given 6, intensity 6 uh, and it is affecting the population, live, livelihood as well as livestock. And the last one that we have, uh, we have noted down is pollution, uh, all kinds of pollution be it air, water, land, soil. And for this, we have given uh, six as the frequency, six intensity, and it is affecting all the four uh, aspects that is population, live, live, livelihood, as well as livestock. So like our group has pointed out a few hazard, and they are almost, I think, almost every comment with everyone. That is a flash flood. For frequency, we have given two, and intensity, five. Po po we give the population effect. It also affect life, livelihood, and livestock. Another one is landslide. Uh, for frequency, we have given two. It intensity seven, and it affect population, life, livelihood, and livestock. Uh, the third one is storms. Uh, frequency we we give it two. Uh, intensity four, and we don't give a pop. Uh, do not affect in our population. Then life, livelihood, and livestock. Then the the third, we give the wildfire uh, frequency, we give it two. Uh, intensity, we give it four. So we don't give the effect on population. Then life, it affects. 
And the last one is earthquake frequency. We give four. Intensity, we give two. Uh, that's all. Okay, few of the hazards that we have listed from our groups are flood, frequency three, intensity three, uh, which it also has an impact on the livelihood. And uh, yeah, that's it. Then second one is temperature with a frequency of two, uh, intensity of two, and it uh, doesn't have, yeah, impact on the life, lives and, and the livelihood. Then the third one is uh, the vehicle emission with a frequency of six, intensity six, and it has an impact on life and livelihood. And then the next is a sewage problem that we have with a frequency of five, intensity five, and an impact on the life and the livelihood. And another one is the hazards that we have listed is the plastic waste with a frequency of seven, uh, intensity seven, and uh, it has an impact on the li on life and life, yeah, life and the livestock. Uh, another one is landslide. Frequency is uh, two, intensity is two, and it has an impact on life and the livelihood. Uh, another one is earthquake uh, with a frequency of three, intensity three. It has an impact on life, uh, livelihood. And another one is a storm uh, with a frequency of two and intensity of two, and it has an impact on the population, life, and livelihood. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you again for participating. But let's see what this report says, right? This is the official one. Uh, they have not considered the human problems, I believe, which road accidents and are, are actually hazards. But what they've done after their Higgs framework is this table. Right. Hello, 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 Hello. Of course, they had the data of year of occurrence, and that's why I we inserted in the intensity, but they've measured the frequency, the year of occurrence, and then the impacts. So the most ones they found were, of course, all of them you've mentioned, incessant rainfall. Did anyone say that? No, right? Erratic rainfall or incessant rainfall. This was all based on uh, the data that they had, the temperature data, the global data, of course. And this is not just something that, you know, like we did in our exercise right now, just thinking about how frequent it is, but actually what the data says. So earthquake is not so very frequent, as they said, but thunderstorms, flash floods, landslides, and incessant rainfall, we see almost all across the year till, till 2013, right? But extreme winds, they mentioned, uh, again, yeah, no data available. So we just had a yes or no answers, which is, which is perfectly okay, right? And this is what uh, we wanted to also see what's if, if there's, I believe it's all similar, like what we did and what the experts are talking about. We're all experts in our own, uh, in our own way. So we see that's, that's correct over there. The second table is this where uh, we didn't see, of course, we didn't see what you mentioned, but they mentioned flash floods only in, of course, during the monsoon in June. June. And then the most frequent one is the thunderstorm, lightning, and the hailstorms, right? Which is it's almost all across the year, uh, barring like four or five months. And then earthquakes, of course, it's all across. But there's a lower intensity. That's why there's like a color difference over here. So earthquakes, do earthquakes happen all the year? Almost every time over the year. Right, so this was it. Thank you so much for the final thing. And uh, I think, yeah, we should conclude by this. We just have one last uh, exercise and then we're done. Uh, and But then before that, uh, I, oh, now it's not responding. I'm not sure if you have our details you do maybe have our uh, work or something. Oh, it's a
Okay. So we are uh, open for questions, collaborations, even after this. So if anyone wants to keep it on, we'll just do it. It was I love pass me. We'll anyway share all the slides, so uh, we'll find it there. Okay. Right. And now Get now. Oh. now is the quiz time. We have some gifts as well. So whoever answers them <laughs> will take all the chocolates. So again, this is an open quiz. It's uh, the answers may be included with what we've discussed or not. They're just general spot quiz. So we on also wildlife. want to be fair. So yeah, and it's a quiz on wildlife, all things wildlife, because we both have backgrounds on wildlife. So we are a bit biased, but uh, because it's an open spot quiz, to be fair, we just want to give you like four or five minutes of, if you want to Google anything, search for anything, like common quiz, and then we can start on. We want like everyone can have the chocolates. Right? So if you want, if we do, if we don't want, want, we can just start. It's going to be very basic. Okay. You don't want time. Nice. Okay. The rules could. Okay. The uh, rules for this uh, quiz is uh, whenever the question is done, you can just raise your hands. Yeah. But don't speak up the answer. Don't shout out the answers. Only we will, uh, let's say two or three people, if they raise their hands, we'll choose whoever raises their hand first. And then he or she will get the time to answer. Okay. Okay. Be swift in raising your hands. Apuni side out. Massage. Identify this extinct bird. We have a hand still, here. You can still raise. Yes. She had the hand up. Okay. You're right. Can you just speak out. What is that? Dodo. It's a dodo which uh, went extinct around, you know. Any idea? And from where? Yes. Yes. And But sorry, we, I think we can give it but. But this, this is not a question, sorry. It's a follow-up question. Plus, uh, please do not Google when you ask the question. <laughs> I don't have that much time. Googling time is over. Yeah. Okay, next question. Identify this primate species that was already discussed in one of the presentations. <laughs> you have to raise your hands. Uh, the first hand. Yes. Stumptail macaque is the right answer. Can we have applause for all the answers yes. because we should be ending it on a on an active. Okay, next question. Identify this primate species from the Northeast India. Anyone? I'll give you a hint. The name, the common name of this macaque is uh, very much visual on his face. <laughs> Anybody? No. 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 Uh, there are many langurs. Not really. It is a langur, yes. But yes? No. no. Baboons are found in Africa. It's 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 our uh, like northeastern. Yes? No. No. <laughs> so his hint his hint was uh, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was not specific. <laughs> Anyone? It's a leaf eating monkey. Leaf eating. Leaf monkey. eating. Anybody? The answer is the common name is uh, the spectacled macaque we would have or the that. fairy's leaf monkey. The fairy's leaf monkey. It is uh, found in Tripura. Okay, can we move to the next question? 
Identify this aquatic animal. You are. Yeah. If if you can be more specific. It is a Gangetic dolphin. Gangetic river dolphin. Gangetic dolphin. Yeah. Okay. Next question. It's a bit tough. Identify this bird which it, it stays more or less in news. Yes. And it from travels. Nagaland. It's just giving yes, yes. you're right. Um, I think we should clap. Yes. Can sir tell us like how how and why did you do you know this? this? No, this uh, recent uh, festival is also there. The, the Falcon, Falcon festival. festival, yeah. So it's a large migrating bird from Siberia, and North Siberia China. And North China. It yes. moves uh, through India from Nagaland. It crosses over Maharashtra and then goes on to the Arabic Sea. Yes, the Falcon Festival. So the that Amur is why it is, uh, awareness is so important. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, mostly of this festival, we know this bird now. So many conservation. Before in Nagaland, it was uh, hunted. Yeah. Yeah. Heavily hunted. Heavily now, hunted. But, now, but those now hunters are now the protectors of, the protectors of them. Right. Yes, in, in Meghalaya as yes. well. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I believe one of the most... Uh, studied and tracked birds because raptor, yes. yeah one of the most studied raptors uh, we know the the roots of their migration okay next is snake again the name is in his <laughs> pattern if you can say the local name that's fine yes yes <laughs> wild guess i know that. <laughs> <laughs> it is wildlife so we'll take it the Thank guess is say. also Absolutely right. Yes. Absolutely. Bandit tree. You know like why or how it's important? No. No? Is it uh, venomous? Or not? By the looks can we say because they are venomous. They are very very venomous. So They are one of the most highly venomous snakes. But at the same time they are very calm. So if even if you walk over it, it will not do anything. Yeah, it also mimics one snake which is not venomous. Nice. And we studied about that. If anybody studied masters in zoology, we had that. What we call mimicry. Mimicry. Bio mimicry. Bio. Right. So yeah, nice. Next. And then next is, do we know first of all? Oh, I've written it. Yes. So feral horses. Can you say what is feral? Yes. What is for fairness sake? Let's see if someone else can say what is feral when it's not only used in wildlife but it's a colloquial language, it's a colloquial word. They're not wild horses, yeah. Uh, they were released by the Britishers the to world. a village in a particular area. I was just about to say the answer to this question. <laughs> uh, so, you know, to a particular village and after that, the village people in that particular area, they didn't know how to rear horses. So, they released them into the wild. So, once domesticated, now wild. wild uh, this is the second generation of the horses that is still there. That's why it's called feral. It's That's why wild. it is called feral and uh, a large part of tourism in that particular area is dependent on this particular animal. It's, it, it's in Assam, yes. Yes, it's in Assam. Very long history for uh, the Second World War when the yes. British left, they left the horses. Yes, Upper Assam. Can you name the national park? Again, Assam has just five. So, that's, uh, you can that's take, a clue. You, you can take <laughs> wild guesses and the people might get it. Go on. Go on. Yeah. You're halfway, You're halfway there. there. He has already said half of the name. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Dibrugar. Eh? No. Yeah. Gar is the the city, city. the town. It's Dibru Saikwa. Dibru Saikwa. Dibru Saikwa National Park. Large flat it, it is the only national park where you have to uh, travel by boats. We and also other ways yeah. of safari. We also the find the dolphins. There. Dolphins. Yeah. Right. Uh, in Very ecologically important area. Very ecologically important area. Next. Okay. Next is 
So we wait for yeah, okay. Next. Again discussed in one of our presentations. This is a very new primate species. Uh, we've talked about this. Yes. 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 Arunachal. What? <laughs> <laughs> then anybody hey, Arunachal is just a state, so yes. we can't give it. Okay, I'll give you a hint. Half the answer is right. <laughs> Second part is what type of primate is this? Yes. Like right. <laughs> you should share the yeah. Primate. I think we should share it. <laughs> okay. Anything about this newly abyss in two thousand what nineteen twenty? Was this actually these uh, big primate species or any big uh, mammals that we discover nowadays? basically based on uh, not that much of morphological characters because when we see the rhesus macaque uh, and we move uh, a little bit up towards hills and mountains we generally find that the same animals have a thicker coat of fur so we think that this is the same species but nowadays there are many other uh, technologies that have come up uh, genetic studies yeah. barcoding so through that also we can identify new species and that is how big species mammal species are being discovered which were thought Still, to be the same ones the same ones yeah okay next the next one everyone will get so we do yes. need to see a raise of hand no no i need to see a raise of hand yeah i need to see okay identify this bird yes ma'am <laughs> <laughs> like one step ahead <laughs> ma'am was saying no, it's not that. He, he said the scientific name. <laughs> <laughs> we have to give it to him. Minor, yes. You got the scientific name also. Okay. So now, uh, the next question is more easier. It's much so you easier. you have to be very swift in raising your hand. We all see this. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> but with the <laughs> get it. Yeah, yeah, everyone is here also flouted the quiz rule. Yeah, yes. I think we'll, we'll just move ahead. We'll move ahead. Uh, okay, now it's going to be, be a bit difficult. Or not, maybe. I'm deciding. Which is the national heritage animal of India? It's uh, very recently being identified. Yes, uh, he raised this up. Recently? Yes. Not so recent, but not old as the tiger. 2010, or the I guess. 2010, 11. 10, 11. The national heritage animal. We have a national animal. This is the national. No. No. It's an animal. So. Yes. Right. And that's how Project Elephant started. Start. Right. So, uh, in the Wildlife Institute now we also have a Project Elephant cell. Right. It's a good information. Okay. The second one. The next one is also a bit difficult. Uh, the national aquatic animal of India. Well, by the raise of hands. <laughs> yes. Again, very recently, uh, I mean, recently recognized. What is it? Well, yes. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. Close, but no. Mm. Yeah, it is, may I not <laughs> <laughs> There's a catch, isn't there? <laughs> now we'll get it. Ah, uh, fresh one. He dolphin. said, he said it, yes. Which dolphin? Yeah. Yes. We have just one river dolphin, yes. So in 2009, it became the national aquatic animal. It's also the state aquatic animal of... It is also the state aquatic animal of... Of state. one of the northeastern states. Can anyone guess? We have more chocolates. So. Of which state? It's a national aquatic animal, but it also a, is a state aquatic animal. And it's recognized in the same year. Yes, got it. Because this is the only state where it can be found. <laughs> yes. Okay. Now is if anyone gets this, gets all of this, right? There are two answers to this. Which two birds? I should have written where, but where the contenders of national bird alongside the Indian peafowl? Of course, the Indian peafowl is the first, is the national bird. Do we know who were the contenders when the Indian government was brainstorming as in what should be our national bird? It did come out to the Indian peafowl because of its rich, rich history. 
I'll just name out who were asked. One was, of course, Salim Ali, whoever knows is a, is a famous ornithologist. And then there was another one from Madurai and Chennai, M. Krishnan. So they devised, they actually proposed two birds. Any important birds who can say could actually be like a national bird? Like significant or very rare or very common? <sighs> Should I give Good another answer. hint? <laughs> what did sir say? Red pied hornbill. Not really. One bird is a, uh, a little bit concentrated to one place. Another bird is very common. Yes. One is very rare. Rare and, and another is very common. One, one is very common. We see it on a very common basis. basis. If you can say one, then we'll go ahead with No. That is very common, but it's uh, no. Think about very, very common birds in your cities. Shrike. Not really. No, not sparrow. <laughs> no. Not vultures, no. Uh, the rare bird is a, a grassland bird. A very, very Indian bustard. She got it. Yes. One. Can you say out loud? Does anyone have seen the bustard? It's like a Florican bird. The common one is the common minor. Not the hill minor, but the common, common minor. minor. So these two were the contenders, and then the Indian government said, no, we'll go with Indian people. <laughs> okay. And I think this is the final one. Is this, oh, uh, the final one is the audio. Is it after this? No, oh. yeah. What was the national animal before the tiger? And can anyone say if this is a trick question? Is Was there an animal before the tiger? No, no is the answer. Anyone else who disagree? <laughs> Maybe a trick question though. <laughs> so you say yes, right? Like it is it's not a trick question. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you're guessing elephant. Anybody? Uh, Wild no, guesses? It, it, is, it is a true fact, but it's not the elephant. There was something before 1972 and before yes. Project Tiger. Ah, no, close, but no. No, it's an animal. animal. It's a large animal. Mm -hmm. It's a large carnivore. I've given all the hints. Lion. Yes. yes right. The Asiatic lions, if you Google it. 19, till 1971. Round of applause. It's a good guess. Yes. So, I think we have to still have one, one question left. Last question. Yes. So before 19, this is an interesting fact where 1971, we had the project lion and then uh, the government realized it's not going anywhere. So from 1972, it was the tiger. Oh, okay. Oh, this is the final one. Yes. Let them collect that. Okay. So last question is an audio question. Uh, the, uh, you see the raise of hands? Yeah. No, don't play it now. She's collecting that now. They're okay. busy. Ready? Are we all ready? It's a, it's an audio file. It won't play here. It's on the phone. So this is the first speech. Uh, okay, sorry for the ad. <laughs> <laughs> or YouTube ads. Good, good. Cut it up, Nagar. No, cut it up. No, I'm going to click on it. Come on. Let it be. Sorry. Let it be. Sorry. Let it be. Let it be. Let it be. Let it We have three chocolates, so maybe. Did you just see the news of Nagar? Are you attacked? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Show of hands, huh? Not, not. Yes. Hulu Right. You also said same. No, no. Pick up. Yeah, no, no. It's a hulu. Hulu. Can you say which species? <laughs> but now, it, huh? Yes. It's a good thing because now they are dissolved. They were broken down into eastern and western. Now it's just hulu given. Okay. The because we have no more chocolates, we are having one more question. Again, audio file. Very common bird. Yes. Are you guys any? 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 Are
This is the final one. Not very easy, maybe. The, the, the squeaks. <laughs> Not these sounds, of course. <laughs> very common. But we you may not recognize. You hear it in your backyard. Or your front yard. <laughs> Everywhere. <laughs> it's not a lot. If you can see, say the... the no, not crow. No, that's a the, crow. There is a crow, no, of course. Uh, we are not talking about not the crow. Not the crow. Huh? No. It's an animal. If you can say the overall animal, we don't want the species. Yes, it's a squirrel. It's the hori belly squirrel. It's the same one. The small one that you keep seeing everywhere. Salah. <laughs> So, thank you everyone. Hope it was a bit more interactive at the end and exciting. I, I had, like we both had a very good time interacting with all of you. Uh, all the exercises, uh, we understand we gave you a lot of work. We did very little work on our presentations and then we tried to get all of the data and in, uh, like the information from you guys. Uh, it's been great, like uh, very rarely do we see so much participation, uh, I've been a part of a couple of workshops, but you were a very, very interactive, very, very, um, you know, interested and active, active group. So thank you. Thank you from my end. I think the same thing. Uh, actually, we have attended or uh, done so many trainings and awareness programs, but we do not see such participation. Yeah, it's very rare. So I think you should have a round of applause for yourself. And yes, as a plus, we, we are all very we are less work. Maximum <laughs> work was done by you. We're all taking all of these sheets, yes, sheets with, us. Uh, with us. If not in sheet, then uh, just pictures because these are all very, you know, very, very helpful for us. Um, if anybody anyone like to wants share to your speak experience? out or it's okay. Anything. If the food was also good, <laughs> and it's like a feedback to the to the training institute. Anything from anybody? Uh, yes. I'd like to say uh, the program was organized very nicely, and um, the organizers selected uh, very uh, knowledgeable resource persons. Uh, okay. so, Thank you so much. <laughs> Hopefully, we are. <laughs> so, but only thing is that like. Uh, what we, these are like stakeholder consultation and uh, what we suggest is we hear our uh, mostly government staff. Mm -hmm. So what we have those um, uh, three days if you can fast check the code and what if you can omit or do fast check the simple issues which are known to everybody. Mm -hmm. But everybody knows uh, these are uh, like uh, taking a lot of time and three days like always like giving me uh, is the top. Yeah. Even fasting and making two days. This one suggestion. Yes. Simple issues and uh, simple issues you can do at lower level, like uh, rural level. But here you can start uh, the simple you can cover in half an hour and yeah. the main issues more and technical and more technical because uh, here okay. all are educated. Yes. Okay. And one more thing is that if such consultation is there, along the start you can call some uh, genuine stakeholder. Uh, yeah. So the debate will be more fruitful and more solution will come. Yeah. So okay. because here uh, it will not be the field and if the uh, you can along with the office staff we call some uh, stakeholder high level low level from village and who is uh, doing construction and uh, <clears throat> this mining uh, 
uh, here I just want to be pleased. So it will be, I think, more fruitful. More fruitful. Yeah. Thank you so much for the feedback. We will take into account. I guess everybody can propagate this to all the stakeholders. Yes. If it was not done this time, uh, we'll surely try to incorporate that. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, we'll break. That's it. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you, you so much, much again. And thank you.